to put off your preconceptions, your preconceived fears and thoughts about reptiles, because uh, that's the only way I'm going to get my story across to you. And by the way, if I come across as a sort of rabid hippie conservationist, um, it's purely a figment of your imagination. <laughs> okay, we are actually the first species on Earth to be so prolific to actually threaten our own survival. And I know we've all seen images enough to make us numb of the tragedies that we're perpetuating on the planet. We're kind of like greedy kids using it all up, aren't we? And today is a time for me to talk to you about water. It's not only because we like to drink lots of it, and its marvelous derivatives, beer, wine, etc. And, of course, uh, watch it fall from the sky and flow in our wonderful rivers but for several other reasons as well. When I was a kid growing up in New York, I was smitten by snakes the same way most kids are smitten by, you know, tops, marbles, cars, trains, cricket balls. And my mother, brave lady, was partly to blame, taking me to the New York Natural History Museum, buying me books on snakes, and then starting this infamous career of mine, which has culminated in, of course, uh, arriving in India 60 years ago, brought by my mother, Doris Norden, and my stepfather, Ram Chattopadhyay. It's been a roller coaster ride. Two animals, two iconic reptiles, really captivated me very early on. One of them was this remarkable gharial, this crocodile which grows to almost 20 feet long in the northern rivers, and this charismatic snake, the king cobra. What my purpose of the talk today really is to sort of indelibly scar your minds with these charismatic and majestic creatures, because this is what you will take away from here, a reconnection with nature, I hope. The king cobra is quite remarkable for several reasons. Um, what you're seeing here is very recently shot images in a forest nearby here of a female king cobra making her nest. Here's a limbless animal capable of gathering a huge mound of leaves and then laying her eggs inside to withstand five to 10 meters of rain in order that the eggs can incubate over the next 90 days and hatch into little baby king cobras. So she protects her eggs, and after three months, the babies finally do hatch out. The majority of them will die, of course. There's very high mortality in little baby reptiles who are just 10, 12 inches long. My first uh, experience with king cobras was in 72 at a magical place called Agumbe in Karnataka, this state. And uh, it is a marvelous rainforest. And this first encounter was kind of like the, the Maasai boy who kills the lion to become a warrior. It really changed my life totally. And it brought me straight into the conservation fray. And I ended up starting this research and education station in Agumbe, which you're all, of course, invited to visit. This is basically a base wherein we're trying to gather and learn virtually everything about the biodiversity of this incredibly complex forest system and uh, try to hang on to what's there, make sure the water sources are protected and kept clean, and of course, having a good time too. You can almost hear the drums, you know, of the throbbing back in that uh, little cottage where we stay when we're there. It was very important for us to get through to the people and through the children is usually the way to go. They're fascinated with snakes. They haven't got that, you know, that steely thing that you end up either fearing or hating or despising or loathing them in some way. They're interested, and it really works to start with them. This gives you an idea of the size of some of these snakes. This was an average size king cobra, about 12 feet long. And it actually crawled into somebody's bathroom and was hanging around there for two or three days. The people of this part of India worshiped the king cobra, and uh, they didn't kill it, they called us to catch it, and we've caught more than 100 king cobras over the last three years and relocated them in nearby forests. But in order to find out the real secrets of these creatures was for us to actually insert a small radio transmitter inside the snake, and we were able to follow them and find out their secrets, where the babies go after they hatch. And 
remarkable things like this you're about to see. This was just a few days ago in Agumbe. I had the pleasure of uh, being close to this large king cobra who had caught a venomous pit viper, and it does it in such a way that it doesn't get bitten itself. And uh, king cobras feed only on snakes. And this was kind of a tidbit for it, what we'd say a vare or a idli or something like that. Right? <laughs> Usually they eat something a bit larger. In this case, a rather strange and inexplicable activity happened over the last breeding season, wherein a large male king cobra actually grabbed a female king cobra, didn't mate with it, actually killed it and swallowed it. We're still trying to explain and come to terms with uh, what is the evolutionary advantage of this. But they do also a lot of other remarkable things. This is again something that, by virtue of the fact that we had a radio transmitter in one of the snakes, this male snake, 12 feet long, met another male king cobra, and they did this incredible ritual combat dance. It's very much like the rutting of mammals, including humans, you know, sorting out our differences, but gentler, no biting allowed. It's just a wrestling match, but a remarkable activity. Now, what are we doing with all this information? What's the point of all this? Well, the king cobra is literally a keystone species in these rainforests, and our job is to convince the authorities that these forests have to be protected. And this is one of the ways we do it, by learning as much as we can about something so remarkable and so iconic in the rainforest there, in order to help protect trees, animals, and of course, the water sources. You've all heard, perhaps, of Project Tiger, which started back in the uh, early 70s, which was, in fact, a very dynamic time for conservation. We were piloted, I could say, by a highly autocratic stateswoman, but who also had an incredible passion for environment. And this is the time when Project Tiger emerged. And just like Project Tiger, our activities with the king cobra is to look at a species of animal that we protect, its habitat, and everything within it. So the tiger is the icon, and now a king cobra is a new one. All the major rivers in South India are sourced in the Western Ghats, the chain of hills running along the west coast of India. It pours out millions of gallons every hour and supplies drinking water to at least 300 million people and washes many, many babies and, of course, uh, feeds many, many animals, both domestic and wild, produces thousands of tons of rice. And what do we do? How do we respond to this? Well, basically, we dam it, we pollute it, we pour in pesticides, weedicides, fungicides. You drink it in peril of your life. And the thing is, it's not just big industry, it's not misguided river engineers who are doing all this, it's us. It seems that our citizens find the best way to dispose of garbage are in water sources. Okay, now going north, very far north, north central India, the Chambal River is where we have our base, and this is the home of the gharial, this incredible crocodilian. It is an animal which has uh, been on the earth for just about 100 million years. It survived even during the time that the dinosaurs died off. It has remarkable features, even though it grows to 20 feet long. Since it eats only fish, it's not dangerous to human beings. It does have big teeth, however, and you know, it's kind of hard to convince people when an animal has big teeth that it's a harmless creature. But uh, we actually, back in the early 70s, did surveys and found that uh, gharial were extremely rare, and in fact, if you see the map, uh, the range of their original habitat was all the way from the Indus in Pakistan to the Irrawaddy in Burma, and now it's just limited to a couple of spots in Nepal and India. So, uh, in fact, at this point, there's only 200 breeding gharial left in the wild. So, starting in the mid-70s, when you know, conservation was at the fore, we were actually able to start projects uh, which were basically government-supported to collect eggs from the wild from the few remaining nests and release 5,000 baby gharial back to the wild. And pretty soon we were seeing sites like this. I mean, it's just incredible to see bunches of gharial basking on the river again. But complacency does have a tendency to breed contempt. And sure enough, with all the other pressures on the river, like sand mining, for example, uh, very, very uh, heavy cultivation all the way down to the riverside, not allowing the animals to breed anymore. Um, we were looking at uh, even more problems building up for the gharial, despite 
the early good intentions. Um, they're nests hatching along the riverside, producing hundreds of hatchlings. It was just an amazing sight. And this was actually just taken last year. But uh, then the monsoon arrives, and uh, unfortunately, downriver, there's always a dam, there's always a barrage, and phew, they get washed down to their doom. Luckily, there is still a lot of interest. My pals in the crocodile specialist group of the IUCN, the Madras Snake Park, an NGO, the World Wildlife Fund, the Wildlife Institute of India, state forest departments, and the Ministry of the Environment. We all work together on stuff, but it's possibly and definitely not enough. So, for example, um, in the winter of 2007 and 2008, there was this incredible die-off of gharial in the Chumbal River. Suddenly, dozens of gharial appearing on the river dead. Why? How could it happen? This is a relatively clean river. The Chumbal, if you look at it, clear water. People you know, scoop water out of the Chumbal and drink it, something you wouldn't do in most North Indian rivers. So in order to try to find out the answer to this, we got veterinarians from all over the world working with Indian vets to try to figure out what was happening. I was there for a lot of the necropsies on the riverside, and we uh, actually looked through um, all their organs and tried to figure out what was going on, and it came down to something called gout, which, as a result of kidney breakdown, is actually uric acid crystals throughout the body, and worse, in the joints, which made the uh, gharial unable to swim, and it's a horribly painful death. Just downriver from the Chumbal is the filthy Yamuna River, the sacred Yamuna River. Uh, I hate to be so ironic and sarcastic about it, but it's the truth. It's just one of the filthiest cesspools you can imagine. It flows down through uh, Delhi, Mathura, Agra, and gets just about every bit of effluent you can imagine. So. It, it seemed that the toxin that was killing the gharial was something in the food chain, something in the fish they were eating. And, you know, once a toxin is in the food chain, everything is affected, including us, because these rivers are the lifeblood of people all along their course. In order to try to answer some of these questions, we again turn to technology, to uh, biological technology, in this case, again, telemetry, putting radios on 10 gharial, and actually following their movements. They're being watched every day as we speak to try to find out what this mysterious toxin is. The Chumbal River is an absolutely incredible place. It's a, a, a place that's famous to a lot of you who know about the bandits, the, the Dakoits who used to uh, work up there, and there still are quite a few around, but Fulan Devi was one, which actually Sheikh Kapoor made an incredible movie, The Bandit Queen, which I urge you to see. You get to see the incredible landscape as well. But again, heavy fishing pressures. Uh, this is uh, one of the last repositories of the Ganges River dolphin, various species of turtles, thousands of migratory birds, and fishing causing problems like this. And then now the, the whole sort of new elements of human intolerance for, for river creatures like the gharial means that instead of, um, in, if they don't drown in the net, then they simply cut their beaks off. Animals like the Ganges River Dolphin, which is just down to a few left and is also critically endangered. So who's next? Us? Because we are all dependent on these water sources. So we all know about the Narmada River, the tragedies of dams, the tragedies of huge projects which displace people and wreck river systems without providing livelihoods and development just basically going berserk for a double-figure growth index, basically. So. We're not sure where this story is going to end, uh, whether it's got a happy or sad ending, and climate change is certainly going to turn all of our theories and predictions on their heads. Um, we're still working hard at it. We've got a, lot of, a good team of people working up there. And uh, the thing is, you know, the decision makers, the folks in power, they're up in their bungalows and so on in Delhi and the city capitals. So they're all supplied with plenty of water. It's cool. Uh, but out on the rivers, there's still millions of people who are in really bad shape, and it's a bleak future for them. So we have our Ganges and Yamuna cleanup project. We've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on it, and nothing to show for it. Incredible. So people talk about political will. During the die-off of the gharial, we did galvanize a lot of action. Government cut through all the red tape, and we got foreign vets over. It was great. So we can do it. But if you stroll down to the Yamuna, or to the Gomti in Lucknow, or to the Adia River in Chennai or the Mulamutta River in Pune, just see what, you, what we're capable of doing to a river. It's sad. 
But I think the final note really is that uh, we can do it. The corporates, the artists, the wildlife nuts, the good old everyday folks can actually bring these rivers back. And the final word is that there is a, there's a king cobra looking over our shoulders. And there's a gharia looking at us from the river. And these are powerful water totems. And they're going to disturb our dreams until we do the right thing. Namaskar. Thanks, Ron. Thank Thanks a lot. Thanks. You know, most people are terrified of snakes, and there might be quite a few people here who'd be very glad to see the last king cobra bite the dust. I mean, how, do, do you have those conversations with people? How, how do you really get them to care? Um, I, I take the um, sort of uh, humble approach, I guess you could say. I, I don't say that snakes are huggable exactly. It's not like the teddy bear. But um, the, I sort of... There's an innocence in these animals, and when the average person looks at a cobra going like that, they say, my God, look at that angry, dangerous creature. I look at it as a creature who is totally frightened of something so dangerous as a human being, huh. and that is the truth, and that's what I try to get across. That incredible footage you showed of the pit viper being killed, you were saying that, that hasn't been filmed before? Yeah, this is actually the first time anyone of us knew about it, for one thing. As I said, it's just like a little snack for him, you know? Usually they eat larger snakes, like rat snakes or even cobras. But uh, this guy who we're following right now is in the deep jungle, and uh, whereas other king cobras very often come into the human interface, you know, the plantations, to find big rat snakes and stuff, this guy specializes in pit vipers. And the guy who's working there with me now, he's from Maharashtra, and he said, I think he's after the nasha. <laughs> now, the nasha means the high. Whenever he eats a pit viper, he gets this little <laughs> venom rush. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ram. <laughs> Thank you. Traffic is a global epidemic. US traffic is creating 45% of the world's <laughs> air pollution. In the UK, time wasted in traffic costs 20 billion a year. Would you pay for cleaner air and a faster commute? Stockholm put it to a vote. I voted for it, yes. I voted for it. I vote for it. We're not old enough to vote. Vote. <laughs> we had to do something in Stockholm to improve the environment and to get a better flow in the traffic. We put a price on taking your car into the central parts of Stockholm and we call that congestion charges. If you start a system like this and it doesn't work on the first day, then you will be in big trouble. It must be perfect from day one. There are 18 entry gates to the city. Each is equipped with cameras. Pictures are taken of the rear and front license plates. These pictures are sent to a central system that identifies the license plates and makes sure that the right person pays for the right passages. One of the obstacles we overcame was the OCR, the optical character reading of the license plate. We went out to IBM's global organization and the R&D centers and find a very good software we could use. And we managed to implement it in two months' time. This is the heart of the system where all images and passages are being processed. Over 99% of all pictures are correctly identified. So it's nice. This is how it should be all the time. Behind me you can see the traffic, and the clock is 6 p.m. Before we had the congestion charging, the traffic was queuing up at this time of the day. I think it's a good idea, because I think that we should take care of the environment in the city. The traffic went down with about 22%, and uh, the air pollution was about 14% better. It's a huge international interest from different parts of the world, from uh, the United States, from Latin America, from China. And it's really a pressure to tell people not what we are planning to do, but what we actually have done in Stockholm. I voted for it. Yes, I did. Not my husband, so <laughs> but I did. I think he is not thinking like me for the future. I'm thinking for the children and the grandchildren.